praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated if you can. Hallelujah. Brother Jordan, I love you, man. I don't know about y'all, but I want that brother to start praying for me, man. Amen. That brother got to go, hey, man, that got a childlike heart right there. Don't go get in no mischief now. Amen. Praise God. How's everybody doing tonight? Y'all doing okay? We're about to get into the Word. We're in the book of Daniel. But before we do, I'm not trying to call anybody out or make anybody feel weird, but while we're up here worshiping, I was just thinking, man, I don't hope I don't get all emotional and start crying, but I got, we got two visitors tonight. I got my sister, Debbie. And got her great, her long-time friend, Kathy. And I've told y'all the story many a times about how my sister got saved and then how my sister got saved and how it affected me. And these two ladies right here are the reason that I got saved. But the Holy Spirit moved in them and moved through them. And I just, I just, I'm just so grateful that y'all are here tonight. And I just wanted to, to give honor where honor is due. Because, you know, sometimes we take for granted certain things. You know, I was sharing with a young lady today that cut my hair and we started talking. I don't know. Uh, it's been a while now. And it started off with something to do with cat people. And I said something like, I said, hey, look, you know what? That, that's all about the Nephilim right there, my friend. That's just another version of the Nephilim. And the next thing you know, it just flowered into something else. And, you know, she, she told me today, she said, she said I, the other night something very strange happened to me. And she was, she was watching, the TV was turned off, and it, when she turned it off, it was a cartoon channel. And when she turned it back on at 3 o'clock in the morning, it was a preacher. She don't, she doesn't know who the preacher is. She doesn't know, she said, I don't even know if it was a real preacher. <laughs> she said, something happened though. And, and she said, that preacher was on that television and said, no, you don't understand. You need to hear what I'm trying to say to you. And she's like, let me tell you. And she described you. We know, we know it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the, 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 the presence of God descended in that room. And, and, you know, I was sharing with her again today. And I just, I just think that the point that I'm trying to make more than anything is, again, I want to thank y'all because there was a time and there's a time in our life as vessels of God. See, we're, we're the people that are called by God. And when we get born again, then the spirit of God comes alive on the inside of us. And God, the Holy Spirit, wants to use us. See, we're, that's what we are. We're, we're a vessel. Right. We're a vessel that he wants to pour himself into. And right. he wants to pour himself out of. And he wants to pour himself out of us and into other people. But if we don't yield our tongue, because you see, sometimes we get in public and we start starting to feel a little bit funny, right? We, we, and there's always seasons in our life. We go through seasons of dryness. And then we got seasons where we're well watered and we're on fire and all this kind of stuff. But I got to tell you that the Lord chose to do it this way. He chose to use us as vessels, and when we yield our tongue for the Lord, listen, you don't even have to know whether or not it went good at that point in time. The Word of God says this, my word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish that which I set it forth to do. God's will is for seed to be scattered so that root can take place, so that a harvest, hallelujah, can happen. And I'm just telling you right now, I'm just grateful that there was a time that these two ladies opened up their mouth and let Jesus come out. Amen? Because my life has never been this. I'm far from perfect, and anybody that knows me knows that. But I can tell you one thing. I do not want to be in the world. Can I tell you that? Amen. The world ain't got nothing for me. I ain't looking to go back over there. I done, cut, I done found me Jesus, or Jesus found me, however you want to put it. And, and, and I have had a personal relationship with the Lord. And by the grace of God, I don't, the world ain't got nothing for me. I don't Amen. want to go back to that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I want to serve the Lord. Listen, we're going to be in Daniel chapter. Hey, uh, Aaron, can you put me on? Oh, you already got me there. There we go. The preacher's slow again. He's supposed to. He's got all this fancy technology, but he forgets to use it, right? Okay. So we're starting. Well, let's see if it works. There we go. There we go. So we're, we're in the book of Daniel. And uh, what we're doing is, is that we are kind of just moving through. And I'm hoping to get through a chapter at a time. I mean, sometimes I end up taking longer with it, but I really don't want to, to take longer because we're really just, we're really building up to get to the book of Revelation. But in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand Daniel. Um, long story short, but I was meeting with some people earlier and at the very end of when I was about to leave, all of a sudden I started talking about Daniel. And, I, and, you know, Daniel is like the book of Revelation in that it's apocalyptic literature. You know, I've used that word before. Apocalypsis in the Greek is how we translate the word revelation. What does it mean? It means an unveiling. 
And apocalyptic literature is oftentimes, it has, very, it has a lot of symbology in the book of Daniel. There's a lot of dreams and interpretation of dreams. God gave Daniel the gift to interpret dreams. And through these dreams, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel interpreting that dream, or whether Daniel has visions and then, he, and then they're interpreted in this chapter here, Gabriel, the angel, is going to give him greater revelation about the vision that he had. And that's why we're going to start in the, in, at the middle of the chapter, and I'm just going to read through because y'all know me. I get long-winded and we never hit the punchline at the end. What I really want you to see here, though, is this, is that this prophetic literature in the book of Daniel, this is, this is how we're getting some of the answers of the things that we know. Because I can sit here and I can say a lot of things that many of you may already know. Like we can say, well, the Antichrist is going to sign a peace agreement with the nation of Israel. And uh, he's going to break it in the middle of the last week, the middle of the last seven years. And, and you know, and he's going to come in peace and then he's going to create conflict and then he's going to demand that he himself be worshipped and he's going to seat himself in a wing of the temple. And it's abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of and he's going to say, worship me and, and all of these things. But what you got to understand is, is that these are scriptures that are taken throughout all of scripture and we're and we're having to understand. See, scripture helps interpret scripture. Some of you that have been around for a while, I'm not trying to get overly technical and I'm not going to write on the board because somebody's got to clean it. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes what, what I will say is this, is that it's called a hermeneutical circle. All right. I know that's kind of fancy word, but it means the parts of scripture help to interpret the whole of scripture mm -hmm. and the whole of scripture helps to interpret the, whole, the part. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that is that you can't just take a scripture and say that it means something when it's out of context with the right, whole. Right. And you can't, right. you, and, you, and your parts have to be able to fit within the whole. And the whole has to be able to fit within the parts. Because God's word, God's not a man that he should lie and he doesn't contradict himself. So whenever we think there's a contradiction in the word, it's because we don't really have understanding or revelation yet. It's not God's fault. Amen. It's not his word's fault. It's our, I say it's our fault. It's a misunderstanding. We don't understand it yet. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. So in the book of Daniel, again, it's a prophetic literature. That we're, I told y'all that, that the book of Daniel was broken up into some passages that were very narrative. What does a narrative do? It tells a story. And then some of it is very prophetic. So the storyline of it was also prophetic as far as I'm concerned. But you remember, the, the whole thing is preparing the world for the end. Do, do we understand that part? The book of Daniel is very much about the end times. And whenever we see, uh, and listen, we're talking a lot in these, in these series about the Antichrist, because Daniel's talking about, about the Antichrist, about the end times. Now, i got to be honest with you. I'm just going to shoot straight with you right up. I, when I was first saved, I was taught pre-trib rapture, and I was very pre-trib, but I didn't understand why, because I didn't really understand the Bible and for the longest time whenever I started to start to see some things and I would question it almost felt weird immediately as a matter of fact I was I was licensed through the assemblies of God and one of the things that you have to agree to in order to be licensed with the assemblies of God is that you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture which they call the blessed hope I believe in a rapture. Let's not get confused, my friend. I believe that the Lord will descend, amen, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will go to meet them, him, him in the air. Amen? We're going to see the Lord. And when we see him, we will become as he is. Praise God. We're going to receive our glorified body. And, we're, and as we move forward in the book of Revelation and other passages, once we get with, we're done with Daniel, we're going to jump straight into Matthew 24, and we're going to do what I asked y'all to do. Did y'all, anybody do it? Raise your hand if you did the homework that I asked you to do. Gowdy did it. Some of y'all did it. I see Gerald and Vince. Okay, what was the homework? You were going to go back and you were going to read the seals. I even talked to my sister about this a while back. You were going to go home and you were going to read the seals. And then you were going to, like a transparency, lay it on top of Matthew 24. And you were going to see if you saw something different than what you ever saw before. So that's one of the things that we're going to get into. So what I'm trying to say is, is that I'm not as convinced as I used to be about a pre-trib rapture. And that in reality, but I am always convinced because the word of God says we have not been appointed unto wrath. Hallelujah. That's what it said. It didn't say you would never be appointed unto tribulation. 
As a matter of fact, the Lord said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He's overcome the devil. He's overcome the world. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we have victory in Christ. Yeah. Now, when we get into that, we're going we're gonna to get there, I promise you. But that's why we're talking a little bit more about the Antichrist. See, in times past, we might have said, oh, I don't need to know about that because I'm not going to see that. Well, hold on a second, church. You know, it, it may not build a big church to talk about these things, but I guarantee you one thing. And, and you, you need to hope that I'm wrong. Can I be, is it okay if I be transparent and tell you I don't know everything? Is that okay? Can you handle a preacher like that? I hope you can. Can you handle a preacher that studied a whole lot, though, and has read a whole lot, and has studied and gone back, and has continued to work with the Word of God, and has questioned, and then gone back and dug more, okay, and, and come to certain conclusions that it ain't just as easy as what they said it was to, to think a certain way. It just, it just isn't. Sorry. And if they don't like me for it anymore, whoever they are, it's okay. I mean, I've, I've come to grips with that. Not everybody's going to like me. But I do, but, I am, but it is important that I please him. Amen? Amen. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope you find out that I'm wrong. But if I'm right, if, I, if what I'm seeing is right, and, you're, and you and I are here to see it, whatever's going on in this crazy world right now, if you and I are here to see it, you will, you will thank this preacher because you will be better prepared. And I'm going to tell you right now, you, you and I will need preparation yeah. if we are here when this goes down. <laughs> Amen. All right. Again, hopefully you'll come back next week or you'll be here Sunday, <laughs> but we're going to keep moving. Amen. It is what it is. Daniel chapter eight, verse 15. And so this is the part where Gabriel, I'm just starting in the middle so that we can get through it. This is the part where Gabriel interprets what Daniel's vision was saying. Okay. It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. See, this is another passage of scripture. This is, has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. But the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 13, be careful, take caution when you entertain strangers. For some have entertained angels unawares. Meaning that angels can take upon themselves the form of a man so much so that the normal human eye would not be able to determine the difference. Gabriel said, uh, Daniel's talking about Gabriel right here. And he says, and I heard a man's voice. And he said, and I saw an appearance and it looked like a man. Now, you know, that that's just another, we're not going to get into that too deep. But the point being is, is that I do believe in angels. I do believe that God allows angels to manifest themselves for his purpose. But I do want to make this point that I never thought about before. And, and I believe it's very, it's very important when it comes to some of this crazy end time stuff. Fallen angels can also take upon themselves the form of other things. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? Well, I mean, how in the world did all this confusion happen pre-flood? How in the world did all this Nephilim stuff come about? How in the world did all, the, I'm just telling you, like there's, and, and, and listen, the angel of light is a master manipulator. He is a master manipulator. And his ministers, Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 11, his ministers also, see the first or second Corinthians 11, his ministers also will perform will transform themselves as ministers of light. Right. Amen? And so there's a lot of deception behind all that. All right, so Gabriel heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. In other words, another way we can say this is, the purpose of the vision it's for the time of the end, all right? Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make you know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time of appointed, the end shall be. The ram which you saw. Now we're going to go backwards and we're going to look at the beginning of the vision that Daniel had. But we're, we're working forward from the middle. Then we're going to go back to the beginning. So Daniel's vision and the first thing that he saw was a ram. I could have told you on the front end what the ram was. But then I might not have got to the end. So I want you to see what the word of God says it is. The ram is Persian. 
The, 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 the first ram is, is the Medo-Persian Empire. So you got to understand a little bit about history. It, you know, I know I, I used to, I, I don't know, I like that show Cars, that cartoon Cars. I don't mean to do my little rabbit trail. Y'all ever watch Cars, that kid show? Yeah. And my favorite character was Tomator. I didn't like like the McQueen as much as I liked Tomator. And he'd say, I'm the best backwards driver in the whole wide world with his butt teeth and his country voice. And he said, I don't need to know where I'm going because I already know where I'll be. And everything that he looked at was in the rear view. There's some truth in that. See, you don't know, if you don't know what's happened in the past, how in the world are you gonna know? No, you need, we need to know some things and listen. This is important because I just thought about it again today. I'm driving down the road thinking about the book of Daniel, thinking about all these empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the great Alexander the Great. And I tell you all this all the time, and you learned it in the eighth grade, whether you remember it or not. Alexander the Great and his conquest and the concept of Hellenism and the spread of the Greek culture along the world. We learned that in Western civilization. Hellenism. Y'all remember that word? Hellenism. That's this description of the Greek culture being and spread and the influence that it had. Guess what? Whenever I learned about all that in school, they ain't never once mentioned Israel. Not one time did they mention that little tiny nation called Israel. But when you start reading the Bible, you realize that the rise and fall of these empires was all according to God's hand. And it all had to do with what he was doing with his people. And then it all makes sense. Before it didn't make any sense. And why would they purposely not tell us about this little land known as Israel? I don't know, even back then when I was in the eighth grade. Why are they trying to hide all this stuff from us? Because we don't live in a theocentric society, a God-centered society. Instead, we live in the midst of a secular society. And they don't want us to know about God. Had they mentioned, anyway, you get the point. All this stuff, the rise and fall of empires, this is all interconnected to the end and to the word of God. Amen. And if we don't understand it, it makes it difficult for us to understand what's going to happen in the end. So the ram which you saw had two horns, and it represents the kings of Media and Persia too, right? And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. Now, you got to understand this. Let's just back up a second. Daniel was, you remember the story in the beginning we've been traveling through. Daniel was a teenager. Him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were teenagers. I don't know what they were doing on that very dark in the day. Maybe, I don't know if they played kick the can in Jewish times, teenagers, but they were out there doing whatever Jewish teenager. <clears throat> and then Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. The king of Babylon surrounded Jerusalem, and then they took those Hebrew boys, and what they did, they brought them all the way to Babylon. Completely different culture. Babylon is a type of the world. These young men are a type of believers, because they're believers, they're the people of God. And they put them over there, and they said, you're going to eat our meat, you're going to drink our drink, and Daniel said, no, sir. We're not going to do it. We're not going to drink it. And then later on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, sir, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bow because God's people are different. And, and so what I want you to know is, is that Daniel was alive in whenever they took him to Babylon. And his prophecy included Babylon. You remember that first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and Daniel interpreted the dream? The head of gold was Babylon. The chest and the arms were silver. That was the Medo-Persian too, Medes and Persians. And then the loins and the thighs were made of brass, the, the eastern and the western side of Greece. And then the two lower legs were made of iron, the western and the eastern Roman Empire. And then the feet were made of both iron and clay and had ten toes. Again, iron and clay, that's talking about the Antichrist kingdom, ten toes, ten horns in Revelation 12. So what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that Daniel was alive and well when the Babylonian Empire was here because Nebuchadnezzar took him and brought him over there. Daniel was alive and well when the Persian Empire or the Medes first and then the Persians later rose up in power overtook the Babylonian Empire because you remember that was when Belshazzar, we've already taught it, was sitting there and he said, hey, go get those cups out of the, my daddy took the, all those, all those uh, vessels out of the sanctuary and go, why don't you go get them because we're having a party and we're going to drink out of them and we're going to toast to our gods and whenever he did that hand came and wrote on the wall, many, many tekel, hoop harshim and he said, you have been found wanting and you've been weighed in the balances and you've been found wanting and this night your kingdom will be taken from you. And so Daniel was there when the transition of power took place. So the interpretation of the dream said, we're going to go from the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire. But look, when Daniel is, is prophesying this, Daniel doesn't see Greece. 
Daniel never sees the Grecian Empire. He never sees the Roman Empire. Those things come later. He prophesied to such distinct detail that liberal scholars, those guys on History Channel that you watch sometimes that start talking about the Bible, don't even listen to that. That's garbage. You better turn it off. I'm telling you. They'll cause confusion. I mean, you do what you want, but I'm just telling you. They don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. So I don't, I'm not here to control you, but I'm telling you. What does that mean? They don't believe that, the, that God wrote the Word of God through man. That's what, the, that's what the Bible's testimony is of itself. Dionustos, God breathed. God breathed in man and through man to communicate with man. Liberal scholars don't believe that. They're constantly looking for ways to contradict the word. They don't believe that Daniel could have prophesied this, so they believe that somebody later went back and wrote it in there. Because how could somebody predict or prophesy these things to this degree? It's got them all disheveled. They don't, they don't know what to do with themselves. All right, so the rough goat is the king of Grecia, which would have been known as Alexander the Great. He hadn't come yet, and Daniel won't see him. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. That's Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the first king of the Grecian Empire that conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. So even though Daniel never sees it, 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 it happened. It happened after Daniel prophesied it. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So let's just get this straight. And we'll talk about it a little bit more. But when Alexander the Great died, and I've already said it before, but sometimes this, this information has to be repeated so that we can become familiar with it. When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was split between four generals. All right? And, and, and here it is. Here's the, what I'm trying to say. How do you make this stuff up? It will be broken into four. History tells us that Alexander, when he died, his kingdom was split into four generals. All right? And, and they shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his own power. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Now, I got to tell you that at some point in time in this chapter, there's a lot of what I call dual reference Prophecy. Let's say that again. Dual reference prophecy. There's something that ha that was going to speak of the near future, but there, it's also going to be fulfilled in the future future. There's a specific person. I've already mentioned him to you before. I will introduce you to him again tonight. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He was he came out of the Seleucid Empire, which was one of the four of the generals, and he was a perfect type of antichrist the word of god says in in the letter one of the letters that john wrote that there is a spirit of antichrist there are many antichrists and there will be an antichrist now you understand that alberto rivera if you've ever heard of him he was a jesuit priest that was converted to protestantism and he finally left the catholic church and when he preached, and let me tell you, you can find some of his old messages. He said, got a very heavy Hispanic accent, but that brother was preaching with the fire of God. And he was saying, all the popes are antichrists. Every last one of them. I didn't say it, he did. He was a Jesuit priest. Why? Because they're over there, and I told y'all this before, and that's this is the kind of thing that I'm just not going to shrink back from anymore. Not, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be mean, but just the truth has to be told. That's what the word, I told y'all, that's where the word hocus pocus comes from. I didn't make that up. The, it's a play on the words. Corpus means body, and it has something to hocus pocus. Something, okay, he, and that's why they're antichrist. The vi they call it, they call the Pope the vicar of Christ. That means the representative on earth. No, the Pope doesn't represent Jesus. Amen. No, Jesus lives in each and every one of us. Praise God. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is, is this: is that is that there's a there, I don't even remember the point I'm trying to make. Well, let's stay focused. And that's maybe the Lord saying, "Come on, boy, calm down." All right. So he's going to come and look, he's going to have, so what I did want to say is this, is Antichrist, that's where I was. There's many Antichrists, there's a spirit of Antichrist, and there will be an Antichrist. And in this chapter that we're reading, there's, there's terminology that's talking specifically about Antiochus, and we'll talk about him a little bit more. But, but listen, at some point in time, it becomes clear, it, we're, we're shifting gears, and we're no longer talking about him. We're talking about the one that is to come. 
And many of the things that Antiochus did, and history can tell us, you can Google him tonight when you get home if you want to do it. You can look him up on Wikipedia or whatever you want to do. I know you can't believe everything on Wikipedia, but that's why you got to cross, cross reference multiple times. Is that he, many of the things that he did, and we'll try to look at those things tonight, the, the one that's going to come is going to be the same. All right? Okay, so he will understand dark sentences. What does that mean? I mean, it's, well, it's having to do with deception. It's having to do, many times people, listen, when God does it, God does that. You know that. He speaks with Proverbs. God's, because, you know, sometimes people act like they want to hear the word of God, but they really don't. Is it okay if we just tell the truth? Right? I mean, whenever, they, whenever Jesus uh, turned them all the fit, you know, multiplied the fish into bread, and then they realized he was gone. And, and then they, he goes to the other side and they come following him. What is the first thing he tells them? He says, you seek, in the Greek, he says, you seek me not. You seek me not because you properly perceive the miracles, but instead because your belly is filled. Mm -hmm. Come on. I didn't say that. Jesus did. What, what is he saying? He's saying, you're, you're not seeking me for the right purpose. That's right. You, you're seeking me because you got something that you wanted. You got a need filled. Yes, God will fill needs. You, anybody in this house yes. have seen that God will show yes. up and yes. fulfill yes. your yes. needs? Yes. Amen. Yes. But if your whole Christianity is based upon, my name is Jimmy and what you're going to give me, and it's not based upon <laughs> God, you are worthy to be glorified and I will serve you by your grace no matter what I'm going through, then we got a problem. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and many times in modern church, that's what we're, we're looking for a blessing. I can remember one time, like, I know I need to get to the Daniel passage, but I can remember one time <laughs> I was praying after the Lord got a hold of me. I was praying in the morning. I was like, Lord, and there's nothing wrong with asking God to bless you. That's not what I'm trying to come across here. I'm just trying to make a point. If our whole prayer life sounds like that, you know, like, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Listen, make your needs known before the Lord. He wants us to do that. So don't take my words out of context. At the same time, I did notice one time specifically I was praying and I was praying something like, Lord, you know, bless, bless me. I need this, whatever. And, and I'm telling you, he may not talk to you the way he talks to me. He said, well, I need something too, man. <laughs> I need something too. And when you going to bless me? Because he only want everybody else to bless you. And y'all know if y'all been in the faith any length of time, dude, that's how I'm a king's kid. I'm the righteousness of God. I got something coming to me. Hey, you know, and everybody's always looking for a favor. And everybody's always, and you know what the Lord said, Matt, why don't you be a blessing? Why don't you start blessing other people? And I'm going to tell you right now, you can't outgive the Lord. That's Amen? Right. Y'all know that. All, All right. right. All so this, 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 these Proverbs... You know, this, these dark sentences, if you will, these mysteries, he's going to, he, when, it's, when it's God doing it, he's got a purpose in it. When the enemy's doing it, he's got a purpose in it too. And his purpose is to deceive and to make it difficult for people to understand what's going on. And we talked about that when we, we've mentioned this harlot in Revelation 17 and how the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. That means that the world, listen to me, the world is, is, in, a, is in a spiritual stupor. Mm -hmm. And much of the church is in a spiritual stupor. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just telling you right now. The, the, the spirit of Antichrist has entered into the church. I wish I had time to break it down for you, but I just don't. All right? And we've talked about it before. So his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. See, just like the child of God it, or even Jesus. Because, see, Jesus functioned through the power of the Holy Spirit when he was a man on earth, all right? Do we have to, we're not going to have to break that down right now, right? You do understand that, that when Jesus never stopped being God. Let's, let's get clear on that because that's the first thing people will say. Oh, he said that Jesus wasn't God. No, Jesus never stopped being God. But Jesus, I like the way a Greek scholar said it one time. He never, he never re relinquished his deity, but he willingly laid aside his deity. Meaning his purpose on earth wasn't to be God. Come on, somebody, help me out. That's right. His purpose on earth was to make right what the first Adam made wrong. His purpose on earth was to be obedient to the Father's will in everything that the Father asked of him. And then to take that perfect humanity and to offer it on the cross as a sacrifice to pay the penalty of sin for both you and for me. Amen. And, and yes, sometimes his deity shone through. Mount of Transfiguration. 
But it was not God's will for Jesus to manifest deity. And he didn't vacillate. I say that. To, I'm not trying to be silly. He didn't. Oh, this temptation is too hard for me to handle as the man Christ Jesus. So over here I'm going to handle this one as, as, as the deity Christ Jesus. No, it didn't happen like that. Whenever he faced the power of sin, whenever he faced temptation, he faced it through. It, it, he faced it. In, now his humanity was different than ours. How am I, how am I sticking on Daniel? I have no clue. But his humanity was different than ours in that he had no sin. Does that make sense? Jesus had no sinful nature. Boy, I got myself all thrown off in trouble at a church a long time ago when I said that. And I, I don't mean to be rude, but it's like it's not my fault you didn't understand that. You think that he, so he said, well, I don't think he looked at little Jimmy that way, but he might have looked at little, come on, dude, really? You're going to look at Sally that way too? No, he said, my meat is to do my father's will. When he runs into Mary Magdalene, he's not over there thinking to himself how pretty she is. That's not, uh, you know, that's not what he's here to do. He's not here to get married to a woman. He's get here to get married to the bride. <laughs> and he's here to do the father's will. Amen. And he's yeah. here to minister and to heal and to set free. Now, you and I might have some problems, but Jesus was real clear on his mission. Amen. Amen. And, and his humanity was different than us. Right. He was at all points tempted like we are, yet he was without sin. Yeah. But just because he was tempted, that word tempted means tested. It doesn't mean that he had the proclivity or the desire to go towards that thing. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Amen. All right. So just as Jesus was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and did great exploits for God in that sense, this Antichrist will operate not in his own power. He's going to be given the power of the dragon according to Revelation 13. He shall destroy wonderfully. The idea behind that word wonderfully is in an extraordinary way. He's going to bring destruction in an extraordinary way. And he shall prosper in practice. And he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. There's going to be a lot of carnage. Israel is going to be, Israel is, there's going to be a lot. Now God will save them. Amen. Zechariah 12. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft. That word craft, I looked it up, it means deception. Through his policy, listen. I don't watch Fox News no more and let you just just because I'm going I go crazy if I sit there and watch that stuff Because I can't change nothing. Oh, I can pray. I need to pray. You Lord, please pray. Oh Wait, somebody told me a joke today. It was a girl cut my hair. Oh, can I remember it? Look Let's see here. I'm gonna do this. I don't even care because you know what I'm not I just don't want to bow to nobody so I'm just going to do it. Y'all ready for this? And this is not because I'm a, uh, you know, yeah, I am a conservative. But look, somebody said they were driving in the road and there was a bumper sticker. It said, pray, pray for Biden. And this was the prayer. Let his days be few and let another take his office. <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't help myself. Y'all might not have thought that was funny. But that was the prayer. Let his days be few. I'm not saying that they were praying that he died. Let his days in office. That's how I think because it wouldn't be appropriate to play <laughs> All right, anyway, I sat it on video. I did it. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. So Gabriel's telling Daniel all of these things, and he says he's talking about this man in the end and that he will uh, have wisdom and he will practice uh, the, the art of deception, right? And he will prosper. And it will cause uh, great sorrow to the people of God. Or, you know, definitely in here, I believe this is specifically talking about Israel. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. Okay? So the, you need to understand that that's a big part of the Antichrist. He's going, to, he's going to demand to be worshipped. And by peace, he shall destroy many. So there you go. There's a, that's a very powerful end time concept. That the man of sin is going to first come. In peace. He's going to say that he's coming in peace. And one of the things that I've realized that the Lord showed me back when I wrote that book that I wrote. Was one of the main things that the Lord revealed to me was, Matt, did you not, in order for the world to want a man to give them peace, don't you think the world's going to already have to be in chaos? Right. Yeah. All right. Now, again, I'm not saying that we're there, but the world is in chaos. I know it's a little bit worse than our little neck in the woods because of the hurricane. But nevertheless, even before that, the world was in chaos, right? 
He says, and by peace he shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's talking about the, the Christ, the anointed one. That's we, They didn't know his name was Jesus back when Daniel was writing this, but the people of God were waiting for the, for the Messiah to come. But he shall be broken without hand. Because you know God wins in the end, church. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick a certain amount of days. Can you just think about that. Think about how powerful this vision was that Daniel felt sick. And he was sick for days after he had this vision. This is a very powerful thing. And, you know, can you imagine all the oppression that, when I say the pre oppression, the the the, the the weight upon him. It's just telling us how vivid this was and how real it was. Amen. He says, I rose up and I did the king's business and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood. All right. Or none, no one else was, it wasn't time to be revealed until it was written in the word for you and I to be able to have access to it. All right. So now we're just going to kind of go back to the beginning and we're going to, and we're going to go through and we'll see how far we get. I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Um, I'm going to keep you here for about 12 more minutes, okay? Now, I do want to, this, some of this stuff, I try to put Bible study stuff in here so that you, so that we all understand because, you know, the days of Sunday school, back when I first got saved, man, they had Sunday school. And that's how we learned the Bible. And so I try to, we don't really have Sunday school anymore, so a lot of my messages are like Sunday school. All right, and that's the reason why. So look here, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me. Now, first thing I want you to know is, and, and you got to read this a bunch of times to know this, who was Belshazzar? We've already studied it, but you might not remember. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. He's the one that saw the handwriting on the wall. Don't you think that's where that came from? Can you not see the handwriting on the wall? All right. And so he's the one that saw the handwriting on the wall. And, and look, it says unto me, even unto Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first, and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan, in the palace. Now, if you've studied geography, and if you've studied the Old Testament, and you've read it, it might remind you, you might get a little ding go off and say, wait, hold on a second, Shushan, the palace, that's in Persia. But Belshazzar is a Babylonian king. So what we're being told here, and you might not have caught that, but to me all that stuff's important. Because if we don't understand context, we don't understand the meaning. Daniel was still in the Babylonian Empire in the third year of King Belshazzar, which was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, when he had the vision. But the vision brought him forward into the time frame whenever Persia would defeat Babylon. And he was in the palace at Shushan, which ends up later on is interconnected with Artaxerxes and Esther and all that stuff which is in the province of Elam, that's in Persia. And I saw a vision and I was by the river Eli, and that's in Persia. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold, there stood before the river a ram. Remember, we've already gone backwards. I mean, we've already gone forward, now we're going backwards. That ram is the Medo-Persian empire. It had two horns. The two horns were high, but look, one was higher than the other. Right here, I can bring you to this place here. Um, in Daniel chapter seven, verse five, and just to show you, because this is another visual, visual interpretation given by Daniel. Look, the second beast was like a bear, and it was raised up on one side. So you got a bear with a shoulder. This is the idea. I've read it a bunch of times that one of his shoulders is higher than the other. Now, and, and, that, and that's talking about the Medo-Persian Empire. And now we have another visual where it's a... Uh, it's a ram, and he's got two horns, but one of the horns is higher than the other. Because, because originally, the Medes were in charge, but with time, the Persians gained power, all right? One was higher than the other. The higher came up last. The Persians took over later. And that was Darius the Mede. Anybody remember reading Daniel? Darius, under, that was during the time frame of Daniel. He was a Mede, but then later, it was the Persians. He says, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward. And southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, the he-goat came from the west. So, again, I'm not going to take the time to pull up a map because I've already kind of taken a lot of your time. But normally when I draw my map, I draw Israel over here. And then and, and Iraq is down here. And then you go to India and China that way. That's all the east. 
and then I've usually draw Greece over here, and then Italy's over here because that's the West. And so Persia is Iran, that's down here, right? And Greece is over here. So Persia was pushing that way, and then Greece comes back because they come from the West towards the East. And touch not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn. So look, if we go back to, to, to not touching the ground, okay, it, it, it's speaking of how it moved fast. And, and actually, if we went back, I'm not going to do it. It's, it, it. When it's saying that it didn't touch the ground, you can imagine it's moving so fast, it's almost like somebody's floating and just moving fast. In Daniel chapter 7, he was described as a leopard. So when Daniel, when we hear the vision of Daniel 7, Greece is described as a leopard. And when you go back to that, the leopard had four heads and four wings. So again, we see the repetition of what happened with the Grecian Empire when Alexander the Great died and his kingdom was split into four, four generals. And he had a notable horn between his eyes. Again, that's talking about Alexander the Great. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran into him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close into the ram and he was moved with choler or that word that's kind of like outdated. We don't use a lot, but bitterness with great bitterness and vengeance and anger against him. And he smote the ram and he broke his two horns and there was no power in the ram. You do know, if you don't know this, let me just say this. The horn is representative of power in the Old Testament. The horns of the altar. Remember that? The altar had horns. That represents the power of God. Many times in kingdoms, though, the word horn describes power. So this, this, uh, this goat that with the one horn was able to destroy the other, the ram that had the two horns. And it said that his horns were broken. <coughs> and meaning his power was broken. Does that make sense? And, uh, but he cast him down to the ground and he stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great and he was strong. The great, he said, it, it, he was strong. And then it says the great horn was broken and for it or in its place came up four notable ones. All right. So I got my little notes right here. And out of, again, I mentioned this to you, but out of Alexander, when he died, his kingdom was split into four regions. One was known as the, Tolum, the, the Ptolemies, it's spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-I-E-S, the, the Ptolemies, and that, that, that was in Egypt, okay? And so if I was going to draw a map, well, I'm going to just draw it. Yeah, it's okay. The person that comes to the phone. <laughs> so here is, here's our little map, right? This is kind of, this is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, and this is that this area known as Canaan in the past, Israel, and here is called the Pleasant Land. And then down here would be Egypt. So Egypt is south. And then like I was telling you, India and all that would be out this way. Persia down here. I, Iraq is the land between the, the rivers. That's where Abraham was originally from. And then moving over this way to the west is where Greece would be. Okay. So Alexander the Great from over here, Persia's over here, and Daniel and Babylon is all this area here. Started off with Nimrod, by the way, we remember we, we learned about all that, and the importance of the Tower of Babel and the interconnection to the spirit of Babel, man helping man outside the help of God, you remember that? So all that started then, okay, so, so whenever Alexander's kingdom was split, you had the Ptolemies down here, one. You had the Seleucids, which handled all of this right here. And then you had Macedon, which was over here. Now, again, Macedon was Philip, was, Philip of Macedon was Alexander's dad. And then there was the other one, which was Pergamum. It was split up here, and, and that, was, that was Asia Minor. Remember the story? Asia Minor is this isthmus of land up here where uh, all the churches of Revelation were located. Remember that? All right, so that's the four. Now, the main one that I want you to understand is this one here, the Seleucids, okay? Because that's the one that I wanted to tell you about regarding this, uh, this Antiochus Epiphanes, all right? He, was, he came out of the fourth of the generals was the Seleucid Empire, and it handled all this area right here. And when we get into chapter 8, 
there's some specific things that took place in his during his reign that equate to that but we also believe that this is similar type things that are going to happen with the antichrist whenever he takes power all right and then it says and then it says the four notable ones toward the four winds of the heaven and look and out of one of them came a little horn there you go the little horn antiochus epiphanes they 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 they, they switched his name up on him because the word Epiphanes, if I remember correctly, had to do with the idea of that he was illuminated or he was the great one. And the Jews, the Jews switched his name up to, to say that he was the madman. They, they did a little play with his last name. What he did was he made an inscription or an image of himself that of Zeus, but he made it to look like himself. And he put that image of himself inside the Jewish temple. Okay, and he demanded that they worship him. So this is, you can't get any more clear than this. This is exactly what the Antichrist is. Missing. Okay, then he stopped the daily sacrifice. All right, he, he would no longer allow them to offer up sacrifice. Now listen, we believe in the book of Revelation when we get towards the end that there's going to be a literal te temple rebuilt and that the daily sacrifice will be initiated again and begins, will be started again. And that he is going to stop the sacrifice and he is going to set himself up in a, on a wing of the temple and he's going to demand to be worshipped. This is exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did. did Y'all ever, we don't, we don't believe that the Apocrypha is the canon of scripture. That's the other 13 books that the Catholic Bible uses. However, it does have a lot of interesting history in it. And one of those interesting <coughs> histories is 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And the Maccabees story tells the story of John Maccabeus. They called him the hammer. He was a high priest of the Jewish people. And that's where the Maccabean revolt came from because of Antiochus Epiphanes. That he stopped the daily sacrifice and he, he wouldn't allow them to circumcise their kids anymore. He wouldn't allow them to read the word of God anymore. And he demanded that he would be worshipped. And many of these Jews fell prey to this. They, 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 they succumb to the pressure. See, unlike Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, no, we're not going to eat your food and we're not going to drink your wine. And no, sir, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down and worship you. Amen. But many of those people under the provocation of this, what's going on in these times, they bow the knee. They, they succumb. Listen, man, sometimes life gets hard and it gets very, it gets very pressured. Okay, and they did, and but yet there was this man, John Maccabeus, this high priest, the hammer they called him, him and his sons, and they they, they kind of did guerrilla warfare <laughs> up in the woods, and they attacked. And listen, the Jews get, regained their independence for a period of time, and I can't remember the name of the festival, but somebody might be able to help me out here. Purim, I think it is. I think it's Purim, the Jewish festival. I could be wrong. If you're watching me on video, you probably know, and I got it wrong. But it was one of the festivals that re that celebrated this Maccabean revolt. And guess what? Jesus went to it. So that's interesting. I mean, that's, it's historical. But look, Jesus recognized that feast. So Jesus knew. What is my point? I'm about to get into it. Jesus knew that this Antiochus character, you might not have known it. There was a time when I didn't know it. But Jesus knew that this Antiochus Epiphanes did what he did whenever he said, no, you're going to worship me. I'm going to put my image inside of the temple and, and I'm, you can no longer read the Torah and you can no longer circumcise your sons. And by the way, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to take a swine and I'm going to put it on the altar, desecrating the altar. Okay. And, and so, so with all that said, that's the little horn. Now look, the, the antichrist is going to do those very things. There's going to be a new temple. He's going to stop this daily sacrifice. He's going to put an image. According to Revelation 13, the false prophet is going to help him to create an image. And they're going to demand that the whole world worship him. On a wing of the temple, he will set himself up. According to 2 Thessalonians 2, and also Jesus talked about it. When you put it all together, he will set himself up on a wing of the temple and he will demand to be worshipped. This little horn that we're talking about is Antiochus Epiphanes, but he is so closely connected to the Antichrist. And so it says, he waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. See, he tried, there, in some of the history, it says that he tried to overtake the Ptolemies. 
and, and it, through various ways, and it, and it didn't work, and he had a battle that he tried to win, this Antiochus guy. And in his place, in his frustration, he ends up back towards the pleasant land. Jerusalem is down here, okay, near the Sea of Galilee. He ends back, back up, and he takes out all his aggression on them. And that's whenever he does all this stuff to the temple and all those things that I just listed. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. You know, one of the things that I would say is the word host describes an army. It describes, it can describe angels. It can, but it can also describe sometimes the seed of Abraham. And in this case, you know, I, was, I would say that, again, this could be a dual reference. And I always tell you when I say could, you understand that Brother Matt is not pretending like he got it all figured out. But I look at it from so many different angles, and in my mind, i got to say it that way. It could be a double reference. And what I mean by that is, he caused some of the seed of Abraham to fall and to succumb to him. But this could also be a dual reference to what Satan has done and what we see in Revelation chapter 12 and how he took a third of the stars from heaven and cast them to the ground. Because that word host can talk about armies of angels, it can talk about armies of people, and in this case right here, it seems to be describing maybe both. And he cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground. The word stars can describe angels also, but it can also describe the seed of Abraham. You remember whenever God told Abraham, hey, come outside your tent. Look up there. What do you see? Stars of the heavens. So shall your people be. Like the stars of the heavens. Okay? He stamped upon, look, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, here you go, the daily sacrifice was taken away all right and the place of his sanctuary was cast down and a host was given to him in other words of this people group and and against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression he transgressed the house of god all right and he cast it down he cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered so his wickedness his deception cast truth to the ground it, it he uh, he caused a uh, transgression on the house of God and his and his work was prospering. Then I heard one saint speak to another saint, and I believe this is definitely talking about angels. They're just using the word saint means a holy one, and sometimes they can talk about angels. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? I want you to see these words, the transgression. I'm about to close for you, I promise. I went three minutes longer, I'm about to close. The transgression of desolation. I want you to see that. Jesus uses this terminology, the abomination that causes desolation. When we get to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says that. Now, I, got, I want to make a point here. All right. As a matter of fact, we're going to close with this. You ready? We're going to go to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to just look at that scripture. When you, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, we just read it, stand in the holy place. Whoso reads, let him understand. Okay, now, let's, let's go back and let's try to think about this. Jesus, like I told you, <coughs> attended in one of the Gospels the Feast of Purim. And again, I'm thinking I'm saying it right. If I'm not, please forgive me. The feast that celebrated the Maccabean Revolt. All right? Now, Purim is actually the one for Esther. Sorry, that's the wrong one. I think it's the Festival of Lights or something. Jesus, in one of the feasts in the gospel, attended this feast, all right, where he recognizes the Maccabean revolt. Does that make sense? So he knew in the past that this guy Antiochus existed. And he knew in the past from the history that he offered up a swine on the altar, that he knew the book of Daniel, where it talked about the, this abomination or this desolation that took place. And then in Matthew 24... He's over here. He was teaching on the Mount of Olives. Now he's over here teaching about the end of the world in Matthew 24. And he's telling those that are listening to him. And he said, this is what he says. He says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Well, wait, Jesus, what are you talking about? The abomination of desolation already took place in the time frame of the Maccabean revolt when Antiochus Epiphanes put the swine on the altar and made us quit. You knew, you know that, Jesus. You know the issue. No, 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 no. It's going to happen again. You need to understand it's going to happen again. 
when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, dual reference prophecy, it happened, it's going to, it, from Daniel's perspective, it hadn't happened yet. So it happened in Daniel's future, but Jesus is telling us, but that wasn't the end, my friend. That was just a partial fulfillment of a future fulfillment that will take place when the Antichrist does the very thing where he exalts himself, he puts an image in the temple, he, and he stops the sacrifice, okay, and he says, worship me. And with all that said, I'm closing with that. Huh? Light Hanukkah? Yes, I think that's it. The, the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. Thank you. And so there you go. Jesus went and he celebrated that in one of the Gospels, so he recognized it. So my point to all of that was that he knew all this stuff had happened. And when he says this in Matthew 24, he's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. So you and I are already privy to some information that the Antichrist is going to do this very kind of thing. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. Your word is truth, Lord God. You have prepared your people, Lord, through your word. And it's just it, you desire for us to dig and to search like it's a treasure. And Lord, we pray, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that you give us understanding. Lord, the Apostle Paul prayed for the pray for the church of Ephesus and said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Lord. Our inner man has an understanding and has a set of eyes, their spiritual eyes. Lord, we pray that you would open them up and that you would enlighten them so that we'd be able to see. We pray that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear and that you'd give us discernment for the times that we're living in, Lord. We want to be able to hear your voice. We want to be able to know where we're going, Lord God. We pray that you would help us to see your word clearly, Lord. I pray for the people in the congregation tonight, those that watched on video. Lord, I pray for those that will watch, Lord, that you would minister, that you would prepare. And, Lord God, that you would give us strength in these end days to face, Lord God, whatever it is that's coming, Lord. Knowing that you are our victorious warrior, knowing that you've already won the war and you've allowed us to engage in the battle. What a great honor, Lord, that you've allowed us to be part of what you're doing. Help us to see it. Help us to recognize it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. May the Lord be with you this rest of this week. Amen. <clears throat>